Welcome to Raven session on animism, shamanic journey and therapeutic shamanism with Paul Francis. Hi Paul! Hi Kaya, good to see you again. Today we're going to talk about the tree of life, sometimes also called the totem pole and how it can help us connect with our shamanic practice in a more embodied way. Can you tell me a bit about the tree of life and what it means in shamanism and animism? Shamanic healing is obviously a form of energy medicine. It's not a physical thing like surgery or osteopathy or something. Any system that works with energy has got to have some understanding of the energy systems of the human body. So a big part of shamanic healing work is understanding the spiritual bodies, the soul body, the mental body, the emotional body and the physical body and how all these things fit together and relate. And so this particular aspect of shamanism is one of the real foundation of shamanic practice, really. It's a, it's a huge body of knowledge. And it's partly based on understanding that there are different energy centres in the body. So it's about understanding how these are formed, what they are, what their properties are, how they relate to each other and what each one of these goes on to form and create and how this goes on to relate to the mental and emotional bodies and literally is the blueprint for creating the physical body and all the different organs and systems and so on. And then obviously how to work with them, what to do with this knowledge. So there's a whole series of practices and techniques as well that go along with the knowledge. So we have these energy centers in our body from a shamanic perspective. These sort of run through the body. They form like almost what looks like a trunk of a tree. And then each one has kind of what look like branches or roots, depending where it is, sort of coming off them. And these literally extend down below the physical body uh, into the earth itself and even further down into the lower world. And then up above the top of the physical body into uh, sky and then also into the upper world. From a shamanic point of view, this energy body we have is also rooted in the upper world and the lower world as well. Mm. And so it does look like a bit like a tree um, with its roots down, its trunk and its branches. So it, you'll sometimes see it called the tree of life, essentially. I've seen the teaching sometimes referred to as the totem pole. Can you say a bit about that? If you think about these centres in the body, each one can be represented sometimes in animal form or something. We can come onto that a bit later. So it can look like a totem pole. The thing with the totem pole is it's really specific cultural reference. I mean, that really largely comes from sort of Native North American cultures. I'm not of that heritage, so I'm not qualified or claiming to be able to teach that aspect of it or that particular application of it. Sometimes I use the term totem pole just because that's kind of what people understand by it and it's kind of what will bring people in and things. But my preferred term really is the tree of life because it's not a culturally specific thing. The knowledge itself is cross-cultural. It's not from a particular culture. So the version you teach at college is not from any particular lineage. I've seen some people place great importance on the notion of lineage in shamanism. Can you tell us what your thoughts are on that? In shamanism and animism, there are lots of different ideas about pretty much everything. And this includes lineages and their importance. There are different ideas about how to practice shamanism, even what shamanism is or isn't, or what qualifies as shamanism. Mm. There's endless debates about the dividing line between shamanism and animism, about how old shamanism and, is and so on. Everybody has their own thoughts and ideas on this, and I do too. There's a saying in shamanism, does it grow corn? Meaning, does it work? Mm. And my approach is not only does it grow corn, does it grow good corn? Does this work well, essentially? Animism is very ancient. All hunter-gatherer cultures practice it. That's all our ancestors before we started adopting agriculture and what's sometimes called the fall. From what we know about these cultures through recent contact with them, because there were hunter-gatherers cultures until fairly recently, but also from what we know through anthropology and all sorts of things, they were pretty practical people and pretty flexible and adaptable too. I mean, to be honest, if you live in a small band of only 20 to 100 people, to survive, you're going to have to just be pretty practical and not hung mm -hmm. up on dogma and stuff. They also didn't have writing, of course. I mean, once we invent writing, then things can become much more fixed. I mean, look at the arguments still about various interpretations of the Bible. You know, it was written 2,000 mm -hmm. years ago. So. 
So from what I can see, lineages, traditions, the attachment to doing things in a very fixed and prescribed way, the annoyance with people who don't do things in that way, all that stuff, that's just stuff that starts to emerge quite recently in human history, really, mm -hmm. before agriculture in the fall. All our ancestors were animists. That's 95 to 99% of the generations of your ancestors. Animism doesn't belong to a particular culture. And so it's not of a particular lineage or tradition. Um, it's just something that's completely, or was completely natural to us. It's our birthright. It's the way we should be. So like it or not and some people in the shaman community really don't like it shamanism <laughs> is vast and broad and there are a thousand ten thousand different ways of doing it i don't think it's my job to tell anybody how to do it i can just offer this works for me try this and i don't think it's anybody else's job to tell other people or police people's practice either um, so whilst I respect other people who are really into lineages and traditions and things, it's just not my path. And I think, you know, all paths are good if they grow good shamanic corn. And where did you first learn about the tree of life? I had lots of interesting experiences as a child um, in terms of sort of energy things happening in my body. I actually found in, my dad wasn't into any of this stuff at all, but he had spent some time in India during the war. So he had this book on uh, Kundalini meditations in his library. And I found it at the age of eight. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's a very interesting ex energy experiences. In my twenties, I mean, I was trying all sorts of paths out like people often do in their twenties. And I did study different energy systems, like through astrology and so Western hermetic and alchemical medicine. I looked at um, traditional Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, and various sort of things. So I kind of had an understanding of energy models, and but it was kind of quite um, conceptual, I think, heady. Mm. And then I started studying something called polarity therapy, which was... Uh, put together by a guy who was an osteopath and a chiropractor, but he got into sort of Ayurveda medicine, invented this his own system, really. And it, it was basically um, a hands-on approach, but based on a very detailed understanding of the human energy body, the chakra system, like energy centers in the body. The guy who was teaching me was really, really adamant that this energy model we were learning was from India, from the Vedic tradition. That just wasn't what I was experiencing, because I was also into shamanism at the time, and I just thought, wow, this is much older. And when I was doing the techniques and things, I used to look up and they'd be like my Hunt Together Shamanic Guide, sort of, oh, he's remembering, you know, and stuff. And <laughs> like, telling me little adjustments to make and things. And I kept trying to talk to my teacher about this, and he was absolutely not having it at all. So one day I was talking to one of the other students uh, about this, and she was Mexican and had studied with Mexican shamans. And she said, oh, thank God. That's exactly what I'm experiencing too. There were really like quite precise things, like we were learning different vowel sounds for different energy centres in the body, and being taught this was from India. And then... This one was sent. That's they're exactly the same as I've been taught by Mexican shamans in Northwest Mexico. It became really clear to me that this is very old. That was really a trigger to what became a lifelong quest, really, to study different energy systems around the world. And and the more I did it, the more. And then you talked to my shamanic guides about it and journeyed on it. The more it kind of started to really understand. And the more I kind of start to strip away some of the more um, current layers that have been put on this, this is really old stuff. Although different cultures in the world will obviously have interpreted it differently and implemented it differently, the, the fundamental underlying principles of it are not only really, really ancient, they're also pretty much universal from what I can see. So I started trying to piece it all together. And in doing that, it's impossible to not put a slant on it. You have to. It's like 
painting you can be trying to paint some sort of great archetypal thing but you're inevitably going to interpret it in some way so I'm not claiming this is some kind of pure thing what I tried to do though is to keep it as close to the underlying principles as possible so that people can make it their own essentially yeah that's the kind of short version <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great so what are chakras? Can you maybe tell us a bit more about that? Most people's understanding of them is either going to be through is that yoga or kundalini, the tantra stuff, or through certain new age stuff, because new age stuff sort of popularized them. So most people do tend to think of them as sort of something that originated in India. It means wheel. It's a thing that spins in our body. In terms of doing the left brain research, but also in terms of my own journeying and talking to my guides, you find these all over the world. Um, what they are, are particular centres of energy in the body, each one having its own particular qualities. And from each of these, a whole pile of other stuff then flows out, other stuff is created, um, particular mental qualities, emotional qualities the blueprints to form particular kinds of organ and tissue and so on. Imbalances in the chakra system, and five of them in particular relate to the five elements of air, fire, water, earth and ether. So imbalances in those fundamentals of energy patterns then can have ripple effects out into mental, emotional, physical patterns as well. And how does the exploration of each chakra contribute to building our personal inner titan pole? So like I was saying earlier, personally, I'd, I like to try to keep a fairly non-prescriptive approach. Books or teachings on the chakras that get very prescriptive. So this chakra, it's this particular gemstone or this particular plant or this particular animal and so on and so on. It's a bit like um, the medicine wheel teaching as well. East is this particular animal and West is this particular animal, so on and so on. For me, shamanism is based on much deeper core principles and what our animist ancestors always did was to take this core knowledge and these core practices and then apply them in a very pragmatic way as i was saying earlier to the times and the environment they lived in it's a very practical form of spirituality so the problem is as we start to lose our way as a species and start to kind of write things down and get increasingly dogmatic and things become much more prescriptive so somebody writes down oh this chakra is this gemstone and people everyone kind of goes oh right so this chakra is that gemstone and things and it becomes kind of fixed and it it's usually one person's idea it's also from a particular culture my approach to shamanism is always trying to be to teach the principles and let people find out for themselves really let them personalize it my job as i see it as a teacher is to try to give people enough information to get started and then to give them some practical ideas about the, how they can explore this for themselves and then the rest my hope is will become based on their own personal experience it's one of the things i love about this approach is it is based on direct personal experience i'm just here to give some ideas to try out basically so rather than saying this chakra relates to this particular animal on the course what we'll do is we'll go through each chakra in turn uh, i'll be giving enough information to sort of get the basic principles of that chakra so you know this chakra say is related to the water element and so on and so on so rather than then tell them it's this particular animal what animal is going to be the best watery animal for them mm. what's the particular water animal they need to help mm. with their water imbalances what's the particular air animal that's going to help with their particular brand of emotional air issues and so on and so on and so the same with plants and the same with stones and so on we start off some the basic principles but then people will very much be able to personalize it according to their own experiences and and teaching from their own guides rather than from me which is always how it should be so we start then right at the bottom mm -hmm. like the way a tree grows first with roots 
and with the energy centers that connect us to the earth and to the lower world that are actually lower down even than our physical body that we establish some really strong roots and then each session we will gradually move up the energy centers session by session so we then literally build our own inner totem pole if you like our own grow our own inner tree of life finding the appropriate animal plant stone and so on and so on until we build up and actually then out the top of the body to connect with sky and for students that know how to do it with the upper world itself as well and so what people get is a very embodied thing that also really roots them in the lower world and also anchors them firmly in the upper world like a tree mm. strong roots strong trunk strong branches reaching up to sky wow. that sounds exciting well it is <laughs> so what do people get from doing this course what are the the biggest benefits i think probably one of the biggest things specifically this course does um i mean in terms of the feedback i get from students is it does really somehow make the shamanic work far less disembodied far less sort of ethereal and vague and abstract and it turns it instead into something very visceral, very, very connected to the body, very kind of real uh, in that sense. Uh, it becomes like shamanism embodied. Th there's a lot of information in it. That it's, This is really a, an extraordinary body of knowledge. It helps people understand from a shamanic perspective the connections between their physical body, maybe physical symptoms they have, how that relates much more precisely to the mental emotional issues they have, and the connection with soul and spirit and so on. And there's lots of really practical applications of this stuff. So like I say, shamanism is very pragmatic and practical. I mean, it opens up huge doors with your shamanic practice and journeying and you can also relate it to meditation practices you might already have and we would be learning actual meditation specifically to do with this as well but down to about pra really practical things like um, the application of particular herbs diet so as well as anybody who just wants to deepen their shamanic practice or anybody that is interested in the energy model anybody that's also got any prior knowledge of things like kundalini tantra reiki or even herbalism and so on and so on you will be able to really take this knowledge and apply it to the stuff you already know which will add a whole sort of shamanic dimension to your other stuff you know as well I understand that part of the chakra system involves the element system of ether, air, fire, water and earth, as you said. This is also covered in another course you offer, the Medicine Wheel or Wheel of Life course. Uh, for people who have done that course already, can you say a little about whether is it worth doing the Tree of Life as well? Yes, <laughs> sure answer. If you think about a piece of cloth material, um, there's two kinds of threads. There's threads that go that way and the threads that go that way called the warp and the weft, yeah? The medicine wheel is the warp and the tree of life is the weft. They both incorporate as part of them the five elements, but they are looking at them in different ways. The medicine wheel, or the cycles of life, tends to understand the elements in relation to the greater cycles in nature. And the tree of life really roots them in the body. And the two together form the complete understanding of um, the human energy system. They're two essential parts of a much bigger whole, really. So although if you've done the medicine wheel, there will be a small amount of certain points that would be revision, if you like, and useful revision as well. I mean, you know, I'm constantly still learning more about the five element system. The tree of life will give you a very different take on the five elements and also includes a huge amount of other stuff too that isn't on the medicine wheel. So who is the course for? Do students need any prior knowledge of the chakra system to do the course? Absolutely not. No, you can absolutely come to this uh, with no prior knowledge whatsoever. If you have already that, got that stuff, honestly, I can guarantee that 
you will find a whole load of unique and um, additional knowledge and information and insights, really. Mm. Um, but you absolutely don't need anything at all. Some people might think of the chakras as a bit i don't know new agey or flaky or something that's that's kind of really unfortunate because what we're looking at here is a really fundamental building block of shamanism that's very very ancient really as well there's nothing nothing new agey or flaky about this it's the opposite it's very very embodied and practical are there any other courses students need to have done before doing the tree of life Ah, that's a good question. On the website, this course is classed as one of the further steps courses, which kind of implies you have to done the next steps courses first. Um, it's only classed as a further steps course just because it's a longer course than usual. The only thing you need to have done to do this course is you must have done one of our first steps courses. That's an absolute. Mm -hmm. Any student has done that can go on to this and in some ways it's an ideal course to go on to next because it really does start really really rooting you in the lower world if all you've done is a first steps you will build such a solid practice as we work up um when I'm teaching, I'll be mindful of who's done what and give different options of doing things. What if students can't make the live sessions? Will recordings of the session be available? So there's 12 theory sessions. They'll be released on a roughly weekly basis and they're pre-recorded. So you can do those in your own time pace. There's also eight two-hour live sessions. They're focused not on the teaching anymore. We've just recently changing this. So they're really about sharing experiences of journeys. Students really do tell us they get so much out of sharing their journeys and listening to other people's journeys. And just that human contact and discussing things. Mm -hmm. The live sessions are very much focused on the experiential side of the work and also on the human interaction and community and tribe. Mm -hmm. With the pre-recorded theory sessions, people will be doing them at different paces. Um, so when it comes to the live sessions, people will journey up to where they are, basically. Um, so, you know, it doesn't matter if people are at different stages doing different kinds of journeys. Well, you know, you can still share them and listen to them. And then there's also the forums, uh, which is a place to ask questions and discuss stuff. And there's a huge amount of learning goes on on those. I'll do a sort of extra bonus recording to answer any questions and stuff. And there's loads of handouts and other resources and things. Sounds like a really amazing course. Thank you, as always, for sharing your wisdom with us. And see you next time. Okay. Bye. Bye.